Beck and the Shanty, uh, welcome back. Um, the last time we were here, we talked about no poaching agreements with Brian Masternak. And Brian actually mentioned during that broadcast that there were some other issues we needed to deal with, with things like a non-compete, non-solicit agreements. Um, and he wanted to have somebody smarter than him come and talk about that. Well, I mean, that's not that hard a bar to get over. So um, I did find Ed Bardelli. I don't know if he's smarter than Brian, but he, he's a pretty smart guy. In, in all fairness, I've known Ed for like 30 years now, Eddie. Yeah. And we work very closely together because Ed, in addition to being a fabulous litigator and a member of management at the firm and all that stuff, happens to specialize in employment litigation. So we share a lot of clients and we do a lot of work together. And I will tell you this right now. Um, if one of my kids needed a lawyer to save their life, this is the guy I would call. He's a superb litigator, a wonderful lawyer and a great guy and a Renaissance man. So say hello, Eddie. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. I would really appreciate that. Well, I, I, I mean it in all sincerity. So let's talk about non-competes um you know i I'm, I'm not whole clear here on what the difference between a non-compete and a non-solicit agreement is what are we talking about when we talk about those two things yeah i think it's important for people to recognize the difference between those two things um the names may speak for themselves um but what i found a lot is with clients who think they've got some sort of a restriction with their employees right an employee leaves and they say, well, he can't go work there. I know there's a restriction somewhere in our agreement. They'll take it out. And the agreement says, I agree not to solicit customers. Well, that doesn't prevent the employee from going to work for a competitor. It prevents them from soliciting the customers that they serviced usually while they were at the former employer. So you don't really have much to go and prevent the employee from going to work for a competitor, vice versa. Um, you might think, look, I don't care if somebody goes and work for a competitor. I'm not trying to stop that. I just want to make sure that they don't solicit our customers when they leave. And lo and behold, when you look at your agreements, either you don't have something like that or you have a pure non-compete that just says you can't go work for a competitor for a period of time. Um, so those two things cover very different topics, obviously, and judges look at them very differently. So if you had, for example, a non-solicit, but you really were worried about somebody working for a competitor, it's very difficult to go into a court and ask a judge to stop somebody from working for a competitor with only a non-solicit. And the same thing with respect to um, a non-compete. If you're saying, hey, I'm willing to have my employee go work somewhere else for a competitor, perhaps, but I don't want them to solicit customers. So it's really important to understand the distinction between those two things and also to make sure that you understand what you have. If you think you've got some sort of restrictive covenant with an employee, something that stops them from doing something with a competitor, that you that you know what it is and that you're up to date on it. So, so what I'm hearing you say is that the document itself and what it really says is super important with respect to how we go forward. I take it that's true too. Of, for example, I've heard from people in the past. Well, I've got this thing in my handbook. It says you know the employee can't do this or can't do that. Is that good enough? Is that handbook language going to be good enough when the employee leaves? It, it's, it's hard right. <laughs> because it's not, it's it, usually handbooks will say this is not an employment contract or they have some language in there because you don't want to change the at will status of the employees that you have. That's what most employers have in their handbooks. So it, it's very difficult to say, I want to enforce a quote unquote contractual provision in the same document that says this doesn't form an employment contract with the employee. You can have those kinds of things in there where you say, look, you're obligated to do X and this doesn't change your at will status, but you, it has to be worded with that in mind and pretty carefully in order for that to be enforceable. If the employee signs it and it's there's a non-computer, non-solicit type of language in a quote unquote handbook, you can still enforce it as contractual language, but it has to be written in a certain way. So the judge doesn't look at it and say, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't say you didn't you didn't enter into a contract with the employee, but now you want to enforce what you think are some important contractual provisions. So either write it a certain way um, where it's clear that you're bound by these terms, but we're not changing the at will status of our relationship um, versus saying this is not a contract period or having some separate 
document or acknowledgement in a handbook that the employee signs separately. So it's clear that they're bound by those obligations. Okay. So what we've got to get is the employee signature on some piece of paper somewhere where they're acknowledging their obligations. This doesn't necessarily just happen, you know, organically. That's right. With that being said, I mean, this week, I, I know most people aren't looking at this stuff, but we're geeks and we look at weird things. So all over Twitter, all over the newspaper, the Wall Street Journal, blah, blah, blah. The Biden administration just issued an executive order. And part of it has to deal with this topic, the topic of non-competes. So did the Biden administration's executive order outlaw non-compete agreements or non-solicit agreements that an employer might have with their employee? No. Um, There was no law passed or anything like that that changed what employers currently would have with their employees or change state law, for example. So what that did do is it signaled um, uh, certainly a public policy shift within um, the federal government, the the Biden administration, the Federal Trade Commission, how they view non-competes. And as Brian talked about last week, um, you know, the agreements, you know, between two different companies, we're talking about a company's agreement with its own employees. Um, Those are still allowed, they're still legal, and they're still governed by state law. So um, right now, what we're seeing is, again, sort of a policy shift. And we want to be mindful that, you know, judges keep track of this stuff too. Um, And it could reinforce some judges' views that, um, you know, these have to be looked at very carefully, or, you know, maybe their own bias toward not wanting to enforce them to begin with. Okay, so you said something interesting there, the judges view, and I know that, at least in my experience, some judges like these and some judges don't like these things, and the draw you get might make a difference. So what are some of the best practices that an employer can do to make sure they have the best chance of getting these agreements enforced if they do end up in court? Yeah, those are great points. So the point about the judge is really important. Um, It's difficult to guarantee that a uh, non-compete or a non-solicit will be enforced by a court. I have actually had the experience with um, same client, same contract, two different judges, one enforced it, one did. Um, one thing to understand about non-competes is they're, they're different kinds of contracts because there's a statute that specifically deals with them. So under normal circumstances, if someone said, I agree to do X, and then they don't, they breached and you have a breach of contract claim. Um, in the non-compete context, an employee can say, I agree not to go to a competitor. They go to a competitor, they technically breach the contract, but there's another layer of analysis the judge goes through, which is, is the non-compete reasonable? And that really is what we're talking about when we're talking about how can we put ourselves in the best position to make sure that these are enforceable? Because one judge could look at something and say the contract reason is reasonable, and another judge could look at it and say that doesn't look reasonable to me. So how do we get in the best position to do that? Um, one is to actually analyze what do you need a non-compete for? Is there, and this is this is a legal term, but it actually works in the real world, which is, is there a legitimate competitive business interest that you're trying to protect? Um, and is it a narrow uh, restriction that you're putting on an employee. No judge will just blanket restrict competition. They won't just say, um, you can't go work for a competitor for any period of time anywhere. It has to have a reasonable relationship to the competitive business interest that you're trying to protect. So what category of employees do you want it to apply to? Salespeople who have access to customer lists, um, R&D people who have access to um, confidential trade secret formulas and that kind of thing. Those are easier ones to see. Um, Having a blanket non-compete that applies to the whole workforce, including um, janitors or something like that, those are a little more difficult for a judge to say, even if you're not trying to apply it to a janitor. (laughs) When the person who wants to get out of the non-compete comes into court, they're gonna say, this is just way too broad. All you're trying to do is restrict competition and it doesn't have a reasonable relationship to the competitive business interest you're trying to protect. So look at the category of employee that you're looking to um, protect yourself against in terms of them leaving for a competitor, the kind of information that they're exposed to, 
and tailoring the agreements to those folks. That gives you the best chance of having it enforced by any judge. So, you know, we say this all the time as lawyers and, uh, you know, if you want to form, go to LegalZoom, right? But these really are not LegalZoom one size fits all agreements. No. You really got to tailor them tight is what I'm hearing you say. And think about who you're giving them to and what for. Absolutely. Absolutely. And okay. you, you can take your, you take your, kind of take your chances. Um, but yeah, you do definitely have to make sure that you analyze how you want them to apply. One of the other things that I've run into over my career, Ed, is we get, um, we've got current employees and now all of a sudden we decide we want to do something. We've got to protect what we have no protections in place. We have to do something. But we're worried about employees not wanting to sign a non-compete or a non-solicit. If we don't want to go that far down the road to the non-compete, um, what, what should we be doing to protect our proprietary information? What should we be thinking about? Yeah, I think certainly the, the best thing to have in place is at least some confidentiality policies and provisions that, again, that the employee signs off on. Um, a lot of our clients, a lot of mutual clients, um, don't want to go so far as to have employees sign a non-compete or a non-solicit. Um, maybe it's against their culture. Um, uh, it could be employee relations issue. Um, now, in terms of the workforce that we're seeing, where it's been difficult to find employees. It could just be a recruiting issue as well. Um, but at the very least, uh, there should be pretty strong confidentiality provisions that are in the handbook. And like I said, signed by the employee. But what you want to make sure that you do is you define what you know what your confidential information is. You define it so it's pretty clear what it is. And then you actually keep it confidential. So um, you have to have computer passwords. Um, if you're worried about customer lists, only the um, employees who have a need to know about the customer list should have access to the customer list, not the entire company. Those kinds of things so you can actually show that the information that you um, think is confidential is kept confidential by the company and uh, most importantly is worthy of protection. Okay. Um, what if I don't have any of that stuff now? Does that mean I have no protection at all as an employer if somebody walks out the door with a big file of all my confidential information can I protect myself at all or am I just throwing my hands up in the air and saying oh well that's the way it goes no there, there are still protections in the law for um, for employers um, in in Michigan and most states there's a uniform trade secrets act um, in Michigan it's the Michigan uniform trade secrets act but it's called uniform because it's modeled after um, legislation that's out there that most states ascribe to. So um, that law, you don't have to have an agreement in place to enforce or anything like that. Um, but what you do have to have, again, is um, trade secret information. So it's information that the company keeps confidential. Confidentiality agreements help with respect to that as well. Um, but for sure in Michigan and many other states, those statutes give employers the opportunity to go into court and still get in the type of injunctive relief that you would get um, with that you'd get kind of if you had a non-compete in place um, to stop an employee from exploiting trade secrets of the company. So there's law like that. There's other there's other um, common law out there, not in a statute that you could apply. Employees have a duty of loyalty to their employer. Um, some employees might have fiduciary uh, duties to their employers. So there's other things that employers can um, use if an employee is competing unfairly using confidential information, trade secret information, or some other information from the former employer when they go to a new employer that would be unfair. So what I'm hearing you say is if I haven't got my ducks in a row and got my agreements in place, I'm not, all is not lost, but if you really want to protect your stuff, you need to have something in writing protecting your stuff. You do, because the, the, the law that I just talked about, the, the common law and the trade secrets act, those are pretty narrow. Um, a contract, parties can, they can contract for anything. Um, and the non-compete will definitely cover a broader array of um, employees. You don't have to prove that you've got a trade secret that's being violated or being taken. 
in order to get the kind of relief that you would only be able to get under the statute. So when we go back to looking at making sure the contracts are reasonable um, and give you the best chance to enforce them, it still gives you a broader range, more tools in your tool belt to protect your business and to protect your, your information from just walking out the door and being used in an unfair way against you. Perfect. Well, Eddie, I can't thank you enough for joining me today. Um, if you guys need anything, if you want to talk about these kind of agreements, if you've got one you need to have enforced, um, if you know your information is leaking out the door and you don't know where, give that a call. Give me a call. Call your Warner lawyer. We can help you through it. Um, thanks very much for joining us, everybody. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks.